All right, I'm going to interrupt once again uh, to introduce our lunchtime speaker. Uh, we, for those of you who are here to get CLE, we, we're trying to fill out the required times. And while I'm on the topic of CLE, um, if you do not get credit unless you check out when you leave, so uh, be sure and do that. So it is my honor to introduce our lunchtime speaker, Chief Justice Bridget McCormick uh, from, from Michigan. She, uh, again, at NYU is proud to have her as an alum. And she spent her first five years of legal practice here in New York uh, as a legal aid lawyer and at the office of the appellate defender. Uh, she is a law professor who became the Chief Justice of her state's Supreme Court, and I, from based on what I've seen today, I would love to see that pattern repeat itself. <laughs> I think the world would be a better place. Uh, Chief Justice McCormick is known as one of the clearest voices speaking on uh, the reforms uh, that uh, need to and can come to our civil justice system. And so I'll let her speak to that. And she's going to take questions when she's done. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for that um, introduction. Thank you all for having me. It's great to see so many friends. Um, some of you live in person for the first time. I feel like I've met a lot of you um, on the computer. So um, it's nice to see everybody. Uh, I am um, going to talk a little bit about uh, things that other people have already talked about today and maybe talked about um, uh, better than, than I will. Um, but I'm going to try and tell the story of um, the changes that I think we have seen in the last couple of years, um, some of which do respond to these wicked problems that we've been talking about all morning. And um, I hope capture a little bit of um, what I see as a, a glimmer of hope at this moment um, for uh, making some advances. I felt I, I, I understood uh, the last panel's concern about ending on a down note. I, it's, it's easy to do in the conversation we're having here. Um, but I'm going to try and uh, tell a story about why maybe we, we see some hope right now. Um, so I, I do see this as a, a really important uh, moment where we all have to think about like which direction are we headed in. And by we all, um, I'm actually really thrilled about this particular um, conference because it just doesn't happen that often that we have practitioners and academics and judicial leaders in the room together. And so this is... Um, wonderful to see. We have to do more of that. We have, I, I think, stakeholder silos that prevent us from um, making some improvements that we need to make. Um, so I think we've defined the problem pretty well. The first panel did, so I won't go over it in too much detail. Um, but the LSC Justice Gap report from May um, taught us that, uh, not surprisingly, um, the justice gap has only grown as a result of the pandemic. 92% of our neighbors um, can't get help with their civil legal problems. Um, you heard enough detail about it, but I sometimes feel like we hear those numbers so often that that we're a little bit numb to them. So I try and tell the tell the um, the story in different ways. So uh, the 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 amount of money that's spent on legal services for the poor in the United States annually is four hundred eighty nine million dollars. And if you compare that to what's spent on fireworks, 1.4 billion, or cat litter, 2.14 billion, or Halloween costumes, 3.3 billion, um, it's a little bit stunning, um, I think. I just try to turn this around in different ways. The, the, the World Justice Project, Project ranks um, uh, countries on uh, the civil justice um, it, uh, in different metrics. Um, in, 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 in that index, the US ranks 46th out of 46 among wealthy nations in access and affordability to civil justice. Another way of just thinking about this problem and 45th out of 46 in whether civil justice is free of discrimination. Um, so I, 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 and, and, and I like, uh, I really like uh, thinking about access to justice beyond just access to lawyers. I think I don't have to convince everybody in this room that that's um, correct, but that's how we are trying to think about it in the court system in Michigan. What can we do to make sure people have access to information, help resources so that across um, our state, there is consistent resolution to problems 
that matter to people, that make a difference to people? Um, how can we widen the set of possible routes to resolution? Um, so I, I think um, we don't always think enough about how we got here, um, maybe because um, uh, it, it, it's depressing and we're I was trying not to be, but, um, but we, we, in the 1700s, we built a civil justice system that um, that, that made sense. The civil justice system that we built then um, had uh, a, a lawyer for every justice problem, um, but despite uh, three industrial revolutions passing, we haven't updated it much. Um, I have to credit um, uh, Daniel Hirsch for this slide. Um, at least on the left, you see a surgical suite um, on the top left from the 1790s. Um, and then right below it, a surgical suite today. Um, and on the right, you can see the Iron County Courthouse from the 1790s in Michigan and today. And inside the courthouse, it also looks um, exactly the same. I mean, judges have a computer on their bench, some, not all, um, but it basically looks exactly the same. Um, I, I, again, this is not a room I have to explain it all to, but there are cultural reasons, there are normative reasons, there are even legal reasons why um, it's harder for our profession to um, adapt. Um, and at the end of the day, those cultural reasons um, end up beating strategy back over and over again. Um, so even though we've seen many sincere and targeted, and I feel like we heard lots of good news stories in targeted ways, incremental ways this morning in, in, from both panels, um, there's been no you know, Uber or um, Netflix um, for access to justice, um, not yet at least. Um, so now I'm gonna tell you this, this Michigan story and I'm telling the, the story of Michigan not because, um, well, mostly because it's the story I know well, so I, I can tell it without notes. Um, but also because it's not, Michigan is a lot like every other state. Um, our, our problems are similar, um, our opportunities are similar. Um, so telling it in detail in one place sometimes I think helps um, shine a light on where the gaps are. So it, in Michigan, about 2 million residents qualify for free legal aid. <clears throat> and that would, that would, just to put that number in context, if you could fill the Michigan stadium, 20 times, um, that would be the number of people who qualify. And we have about one legal aid lawyer for every 10,000 eligible people. That's it. Um, I, it's also important to understand um, how complicated the court system itself is. Now, some states actually have an advantage over Michigan here. We have a decentralized court system, not a unified court system. There are 559 judges across 242 different courts. Um, the case management systems, when I built this slide, there were 20 different case management systems across the state. It's down to 16 now. We've been trying to pull them onto one case management system with little carrots and little sticks because we don't have any big sticks or any big carrots. Um, they answer to 165 different funding units that have different priorities. The priorities of the, the uh, county commissioners in Iron County are really different from the county commissioners in Wayne County. Um, and then the computer systems are um, radically different across the state. And finally, 83 different county clerks who are separately elected keep our records. So imagine trying to make statewide change work across that system. It's complicated. Um, and yet, before um, we had a pandemic, there were ongoing efforts to improve access to justice in Michigan. Um, that we were quite proud of. Um, we were bragging about them, in fact, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about them and then about what changed and why, again, I feel like we have opportunity. We, we like many other states, our state bar access to justice efforts are really impressive. Um, I don't think I have to detail them, but, um, and our legal services offices are the best in the country. So are all of yours and your states, but mine are too. Um, and we, in 2012, stood up what I still think is the best self-help um, website, michiganlegalhelp.org. Go look at it. It's pretty incredible. Um, in addition to being uh, a website, it ha we, have, we have navigators in courthouses to help people who need help with it. Um, we have an online chat tool so people can get help during the day. And the number of times people have accessed the site since 2012 is 11 million. Um, with the, uh, the toolkits that we have on the site are complete, uh, 325 legal forms are completed every single day. So this is, there, we have some actual data on the number of people who are making use of this resource. And it's been a fantastic resource. We're proud of it. Um, and it's allowed us to gather some data about where 
um, people struggle with trying to manage their own justice problems. And then we can provide extra help in those areas. So one, one thing we learned was um, very few people were able to, to navigate their own expungement process. It's really complicated. Um, you need different uh, uh, information from different agencies and people were just falling off in Michigan Legal Help's expungement tool. So we put together traveling expungement clinics, combination of law students and judges and um, uh, uh, law enforcement and took it on the road and took expungement clinics to communities all around the state and had uh, that had those teams ready to do those expungements for, for people who were not able to manage them um, in the self-help tool. This is all I'm telling you going on before we had a pandemic, right? Really lots to be proud of. Um, we worked with a private vendor to set up online ticket review and then, um, and then gave it out to courts that wanted it for free. Um, and as you might imagine, it's a lot easier to resolve your tickets online um, from your workplace or if you're home with your kids than it is to have to go to a courthouse. Um, so we were able to um, show with data the difference that made um, for the people who used it. Um, and we, we uh, and, and almost every district court wants it. They want this product. Um, our, the the, the in-house team at the Supreme Court that works together with um, uh, private technology vendors um, has also built a bunch of other tools that are really helpful to the public that are navigating justice problems without lawyers. So, We've heard a lot this morning about text reminders. Um, when I got to the court in 2013, um, I started asking the JIS team to build a text reminder tool. It seemed to me to be the most important way to get people information about their um, obligations in courts. Um, and they finally did. I think we built it in 2016 or 17. Um, and now every single court in the state wants it. And um, so in Michigan, you usually do get a text reminder if you owe something or you have a court date. Um, at least you do if you're a court, if you live in a jurisdiction where the court has the has the tool. Um, again, remember, not a statewide system. I can't just push it out to every single uh, court in the state. Um, I, 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 we we heard a lot about why text reminders might make a difference, and I don't think I have to tell you because you get them from your dentist. It's the only reason you get to your dentist appointment. I know it is, but there's some really interesting data about text reminders in the bail context. Um, text the, the the thing that is most likely to predict whether someone comes back to court is not whether they have a job. It's not whether they have community ties, it is whether they get a text reminder. It is the single most, it is the single factor most likely to predict whether someone comes back to court in, the, in a, a pretrial setting. Um, in addition to that, um, we're working on statewide e-filing in that complicated process. Um, we built these docket display boards. So when people come to a courthouse and they're confused about where to go, it's like the airport, you know, they can actually look up on the board and figure out where to go. Um, among many other tools. Um, we've been working, in other words, to build technology process improvements for the people who use our courts. Um, just before the pandemic, we stood up in 17 counties, um, an online dispute resolution platform called My Resolve. Um, it's asynchronous, it's free. You have the opportunity to use it with or without a mediator in a community dispute resolution center you choose. Um, and we launched it in um, 17 counties in December of 2019. Um, and we were very excited about it. And eventually um, wanted, we wanted to learn from people's use of it in those counties to make improvements, process, you know, continuous improvements before we uh, uh, sent it throughout the state. But again, that was December, 2019. Um, we also started our Justice for All um, task force process in 2019, which you heard a little bit about from um, Justice Zelon and from Danielle Hirsch. Um, and we were doing town halls um, to go figure out what, uh, what, where, where the gaps were in, our, in the resources we had statewide. We had never before, we had a JFA process, really done a full inventory on what resources were available and where the gaps were. So we were doing surveys, we were doing focus groups, we were doing town halls, um, and we had a really engaged group, group working on um, our inventory and a really exciting um, plan. We were really excited about it. And then you know what happened. Um, in March of 2020, uh, courts uh, had a big, had a big uh, uh, like everybody else in the world, had, had to figure out how to keep doing business um, despite being a place where um, a pandemic uh, was incredibly dangerous, right? A, court, a busy courthouse 
um, is just about the most likely place to spread disease that you can imagine. It's like, I mean, it's a, it's a cruise ship, except not nearly as fun. Um, I've said over and over again that it's, uh, it was uh, terrible in so many ways, but it was also the disruption courts needed. It gave us an opportunity to learn that we could innovate, to try things quickly, to fail, to try them again. Um, and it's been a, a great, great opportunity that I hope we're gonna take advantage of going forward. Um, so in, in, in Michigan, we had this great advantage. Our, our judges all already had Zoom licenses. I had, we had gotten them Zoom licenses, licenses at the end of 2019. Um, I did not foresee a pandemic. I wish I could claim that I did. Um, it just seemed to us that in a very uh, geographically large state, it might make sense to figure out if there were some things that could be done on remote platforms. Um, okay, just because they had Zoom licenses that does not mean they knew how to use them. Most judges were not interested. They were sort of like, why did you get, get me this until March? Um, but we were, so we were able to quickly train them. Um, like many other states, we um, put our, we live streamed our hearings to YouTube. So we continue to make sure the public had access. Um, and the number of hearings um, and the number of times that the directory has been accessed is um, really stunning if you think about what the world looked like before all this happened. Um, the, that talented tech team that built all those other tools built this really nifty um, virtual courtroom directory that lists, excuse me, you can click on any county in the state and you can see um, each judge in that county's virtual courtroom link and you can click on the link and watch what's happening in that judge's courtroom. So all of a sudden, there was access for everybody in the state to every courtroom in the state. It was an immediate gain for transparency. Um, the Justice for All uh, Task Force had to move away from town halls and move to Zoom town halls. As you've all learned, it actually sometimes turns out that you can get more information when people have an opportunity to give it to you on a remote platform. So the information we gathered was, um, uh, was excellent, and the JFA team um, uh, produced a really innovative and exciting um, report in the fall of um, 2020, um, and it's been uh, an, an enormous success. The court almost immediately, right in January, um, put in permanent court rule, a justice for all commission, and since uh, the commission started working, I have I have gotten every dollar I've asked the legislature for in funding it. Um, I, I, it. It's only taught me that I haven't asked for enough, right? If you get every dollar that, that you asked for, you didn't ask for enough. Um, but it turns out it's really attractive to state legislators who get a lot of calls about these cases where people are trying to navigate justice problems without lawyers. So leg state legislators from both parties are interested in these resources. Um, this is just a preview and I think this slide probably should have come later, but I'm, I added it late last night or whatever, so I apologize, but we have pretty interesting data now coming out of the Justice for All Commission's work um, on debt collection trends um, and on uh, the social return on investment for every dollar spent on civil legal aid. Um, we are working together with Pew um, and January Advisors for, to, to, to pull this data. Um, and it's not uh, final yet, but it's really interesting. Um, it's really interesting data and I don't think uh, it's available anywhere else. So I'm very excited about what's coming out of our JFA commission. Message me later if you want, if you want the details. Um, that 17 county My Resolve um, uh, experiment, uh, we all of a sudden just had to quickly outroll it in all 83 counties and we did by January 1st of 2020. Every single person in the state of Michigan had access to an online dispute resolution platform for their civil justice needs. Um, it is to date still the only state in the country where that's true. Um, we were the first state many followed to stand up a statewide eviction diversion program in the middle of the pandemic. Um, it occurred to us that there was all this funding coming in from the federal government and we knew about eviction, uh, diversion models that had been working. Um, in some local courts, the way eviction diversion worked before we had a statewide pandemic and could put the whole state into diversion was if you had a local judicial leader who was interested in eviction diversion, that's when you have eviction diversion. It was literally leadership that was the reason that, that you had it. 
Um, but all of a sudden we had uh, the executive branch and the legislative branch eager to find solutions. And so we put the whole state into an eviction diversion program. And it's been um, uh, a, also a really interesting experiment about which we have some really interesting data now to work with. Um, I, one of the things that I thought was most exciting though about this period of experimentation and innovation was kind of unleashing court leaders up and down the chain to say like, yeah, go for it. I don't know, try it. We, we would have like court administrators and judges say like, hey, I have this idea. Does it sound crazy? I'm like, maybe, but let's see what, let's see what happens. Um, and that's you know, not usually the way lawyers behave, but in, in one local district court in um, East Lansing, they had an extra Zoom license. And so they set up a virtual counter, a virtual clerk's counter the most successful like Zoom room in the state because the people who are worried about whether they owe something on a fine or they think they might've had a court date, but they can't remember and the kind of thing that they would normally have to go to a courthouse, find parking, find childcare, bring their kids with them. They could now just drop into this virtual counter, ask the questions, a live person looks it up, tells them exactly what they need to know, um, and they can go back to work or go back to caring for their kids or whatever, whatever it was. It's been an unbelievably successful program. The court administrator whose idea it was, it was hers, not ours, um, now um, has trained court administrators all over the state. So they're all providing, not they're all, anyone who's interested is in providing the service. Again, decentralized court system, things, people do things differently. Um, in Ann Arbor, the local magistrate um, was worried about the people who did not have access to technology um, being able to take care of their court business. So she partnered with um, a local detective who took uh, a printer and an iPad um, to places where people without housing um, were, um, shelters and parks and other places, and did court on demand. And anyone who had a question about um, anything they were owed or a, 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 something they owed a court, would be able to log in with the help of this police officer and get their business resolved in parks and in shelters. So obviously we all learned a lot from all this experimentation. Um, we learned that uh, status quo is not an option. Um, we, we, we had lots of conversations. We had formal and informal processes to gather feedback about everything we learned. Um, and, I, and, and there is nobody who said we should absolutely restore the status quo. There are some who would who liked it better before, but and I'll get to that in a second. But but for the most part, nobody was no, nobody's taking the position that we can go back. Um, remote proceedings made attorneys far more um, uh, efficient and therefore affordable. Um, legal aid attorneys, in particular, are able to log into and do a lot more hearings when they have a remote option. Uh, private lawyers who want to be able to give some pro bono time or far more likely to give it if they could just log in and do it remotely. Um, the public benefits greatly. Um, the, it, the ability to not have to take time off from work, but to be able to make a short court appearance in a break room, to not have to find daycare, uh, to not have to find parking um, makes a tremendous difference for a lot of people. It is true that technology can be a barrier um, but so can transportation in a place like Michigan. Transportation can be an enormous barrier to getting your problems resolved in court. Um, and then this probably shouldn't have been surprising, but the information we have about um, people who were uh, intimidated in courtrooms being less intimidated is hard to turn away from. Kids in particular are giving judges a lot more information when they can do it on their smartphones. Smartphones are... Kids are comfortable with smartphones, less comfortable with courtrooms. Courtrooms are scary. Um, judges are getting better information. Um, default rates, to the extent we have data, um, it's clear that default rates in cases where people rep represent themselves, people do not have lawyers, drop. Um, it, there are numbers from other jurisdictions where they have better data, where they drop even more significantly. That right there, to me, is enough to say um, you can't stop offering this option. Um, the, the Detroit eviction docket, just for just to use one case um, example, went from 85 to 90% unrepresented before the pandemic to 90 to 95 represented during the pandemic. Enormous difference because we know what a difference it makes when someone has a lawyer and, or not. So 
We've spent a lot of time in Michigan, at least, and I'm sure in, in, in other states talking about um, what, what all this means. Um, is it just, you know, was it just an experiment? And now that we can go back or we, some people think we can go back to what we had before, should we, or should we um, move on? Um, one piece of a set of solutions is um, that, and you heard a lot about this this morning, is that lawyers are not going to be the only answer to figuring out this, um, the, the, the solutions to this problem. One lawyer for 10,000 people with civil justice needs in Michigan is that the market just doesn't, doesn't match, supply doesn't meet demand. So we're going to have to look at more solutions beyond lawyers, um, and we're doing that in Michigan. Um, as uh, Danielle talked about this morning, um, sometimes it's as simple as process mapping and improvement, simplification, um, making sure people understand what's happening, just information that makes sense, plain English information, um, court clerks and judges who explain to people what they can uh, do to defend against an action. Um, judges are really, uh, could really be um, people who provide information to litigants. Um, and then figuring out how to get um, remote hearings right. What's the best way to get people information if you're using that tool? Um, it's, there, it, it's not easy uh, because as I said before, change isn't easy. Um, my sister and brother are both in the uh, film business, movie, TV, film business. And you know, it used to be, the, it used to be accepted that there is no way, they, everyone would say there's no way you can win an Oscar unless you know, your movie opens in a theater and nobody thinks that anymore because um, the market adapted um, and they just learned some lessons. Um, my sister and I have this op-ed that we are shopping about the difference between um, her industry and is courts, are courts an industry? My workplace. Um, and the difference between when you're when when the marketplace um, plays a role and when when it doesn't necessarily, um, I <laughs> the 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 only people who are a little more resistant to change than lawyers are um, judges. Um, judges are the ones who are having the hardest time with understanding that this is all going to have to change if we want to solve big problems. Um, uh, Richard Susskind uh, says that litigators and judges are hunkering and hankering, hunkering down until the viral storm passes while hankering for a complete return to physical courts. I think, I, I don't agree with him about litigators. I think there are some litigators. They're the usually um, ones who've been practicing longer um, who are the most resistant to change. Um, but otherwise, um, I, don't, I don't agree with him about litigators. I absolutely agree with him about judges. Although we've had a lot of tremendous judges adapt and appreciate the ability to adapt. And you've, you've heard from some of them today and you're gonna hear from more. Um, but, but there are an awful lot who, um, for whom it's been, it's been hard. Um, I, I, get, I get invited a lot to talk about what comes next. Um, I was at a panel in October, last October, almost, almost a year ago, that was, I'm not gonna remember the name of the organization, but it was a, it's a national organization of trial lawyers that was some invite only, blah, 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 really, really successful trial lawyers. And it was me and um, a federal judge and a judge from Canada. And the question was, you know, what are we going to keep? What are we going to take with us from, and they meant what things should be remote and what things shouldn't be remote. And, and what was so fascinating to me is a huge room full of people, like 10 times as many people as are in this room now, was how much everyone just wanted to know, you know, what our opinions were, you know, what, like, what does Bridget's gut say about what goes next? And I, I find it so fascinating because I said, I don't know why you, why, why should you care what my gut says comes next? Like, why wouldn't we care what the data tells us about what we should do next? And it's so fascinating to me that in, you know, in administering our courtrooms, we require evidence to convince, you know, to, to get to a certain outcome. And yet, when we think about how we administer our justice systems, we're apparently quite comfortable with, you know, 
whatever like we feel might be good for what comes next. And I don't understand it, especially now that we actually have some data. Okay, data is terrible. Everything you've heard about how bad justice system data is, is correct. But remote hearings have given us some data that we haven't had before. And I don't understand why we wouldn't use that and think about how to get additional data to figure out what comes next. So the, the last point I wanna make is um, why this feels to me like an emergency. And I, I, I mean, it feels like an emergency for the stories that you hear from the people who actually are trying to, to navigate these justice problems. But um, the you know, law is the operating system of our society. And we, we update our iPhone operating system, as far as I can tell, like every other day, it seems like we, we, we update it. But we don't update our, the way we administer our justice system um, even when we've learned that when we do things differently, more people have access to solutions. Um, I, 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 we, everybody's heard a little bit about how uh, in, in, in popular media, everybody knows that the trust in the court system, at least the Supreme Court and um, the federal courts um, has declined um, somewhat rapidly. It's also the case that trust and confidence in the state courts has declined, not quite as rapidly, but the National Center for State Courts keeps that data and it's not good. I mean, it's, um, I, I, it, I actually don't know how much of the public knows the difference. So I'm a little bit curious about how that data is collected. I mean, but it's declining and it's an issue because, um, you know, it's all we have. We don't have weapons, we don't have money. All we have is public confidence in what we do. And now all of a sudden we have all this information about how we can do things differently and it might make a difference. It might make an important difference to the many of our neighbors who are navigating justice problems without the help they need. And if we ignore it, I think um, it would really be uh, um, a shame. I, I, I often talk about this moment as like the administrative oversight Marbury moment. Like this is the time that the judiciary um, should stand up and say, we have to do something different. We've learned too much to turn away. Um, and the numbers of people navigating justice problems without lawyers is so high that this is the moment that, that we have to change. Um, before I finish up, I, I, so one thing I have been advocating for with my legislature every budget season, um, is statewide case management. You, you saw my slide with how complicated the, the judiciary is. Um, we've gotten the case management systems down to 16. It's still impossible to really push reform, statewide reform with 16 different case management systems. If I even wanna collect one new piece of data across 16 case management systems, I wanted to recently, I wanted to know how many um, courts in a particular kind of probate cases were appointing guardians. I just wanted to know the answer to that statewide. The, the, to, to collect that data was gonna cost $500,000. I'm, I'm, I'm a public servant. We, I have a, you know, my, we don't have $500,000. So I, so, I, so, I, so, so I didn't collect it. So, I, so we're gonna keep guessing. I, I can't tell you right now how many evictions are pending across the state of Michigan. I can't tell you how many juveniles are in detention across the state of Michigan. That's insane. That way. I mean, what, 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 why do, why do we not want to know those things? And frankly, make them transparent so the public knows them, so that we can figure out what we want to do differently. So I have been advocating for funding for a statewide case management system for a very long time. It's expensive, um, but you know, it's finally infrastructure year, week, month, whatever, and all of our states have more federal money right now than we've had at any time that I've been in public service. So it was the perfect time to get everybody together and say now is the moment to take that money and build a statewide case management system so we can make all of that data available, transparent for, for policymakers and for the public and for the judges alike. And I am happy to say that I got that funding um, this October and Michigan will have one statewide case management system and we'll uh, have uh, statewide data that we will make transparent. Um, and I think it will be um, a step in the right direction. Um, thank you so much for listening. I am going to answer any questions you have.
thank you so much, Jeff. I know you've written about the role of judges in dealing with unrepresented litigants and the ethical rules around that. Can you talk a little bit about that, the role of judges in play in these problems? Yeah, so I, 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 I think somebody mentioned this. I have this piece in the Yale, Yale Law Journal about the important role I think judges have to play in um, advocating for improving our legal systems. Um, I, so, and so, let me, so let me back up and say, I, I think there is a lot of confusion between a judge's ethical obligation to um, impartiality in her decision-making role and her ethical obligation to improve the administration of justice in all of the rest of her roles. And I have always been quite comfortable um, managing both at the same time. But I do think for a lot of judges, they worry um, that any, any time they are to advocate for uh, changes that might benefit the public that use their courts, it somehow makes them not neutral. So I've tr I tried to articulate in um, you know, sort of intellectual terms why that's not the case. I worry a little bit that nobody reads the Yellow Journal, so <laughs> I probably should have written it for TikTok. I have to do it. I have to do a TikTok version. <laughs> no, the judges aren't on TikTok. I have to do. A, I don't know what they read. Email? No, they don't open them. I don't know. I have to somehow figure out another. I have to figure out another way to get the information out there. But I personally think judges have so much important information in these policy making discussions. If you don't ask the judges what's happening as a result of downstream policies, you're not getting a really important part of the, the, the information to have the answer. So it is the case that the trial courts are the downstream um, facilitators of a lot of things that are going wrong up, upstream. The judges know what's happening in the opioid crisis in their communities. The judges know what's happening in the housing crisis in their communities. The judges know what's happening in the debt collection crises in their communities. And if they're not part of the conversations about the solution, if they don't advocate for the solution, you're really, you're, you're really uh, hampering your, your efforts. So I personally think judges should take an active role in figuring out solutions. So obviously my first answer is gonna be, well, I would wanna look at the data and I don't have it. So my gut is probably not that helpful, but I, and I don't even know if there is data on that. It's a great question. There's lots of data on um, elected versus appointed judiciaries in criminal sentencing contexts, and like their sentencing judges, um, sentencing sentences increase as they get closer to their elections. Um, and so there is some good data on that. I wonder if there's data on um, this specific question, and I, and I don't really know. I mean, to 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 give you my anecdotal, not worth a lot because not based on data answer. Um, I see both examples across the country. I, I see leaders um, who are elected and leaders who are appointed. So I haven't been able to discern um, a difference. I think that, um, you know, the idea behind appointing judges is if you have a, if you have lifetime tenure, which isn't true in most state court appointment systems, but if you do, you, you, you're free to actually just, you know, do things that might be unpopular or you worry might be unpopular. I, I know a lot of elected judges who are real leaders in this space. So I, I, don't, I don't know how to parse all that. I would, I'd be interested in data if it's out there. <laughs> That's all right. Is there any effort made to measure data on the productivity of judges? And if there is, how do judges feel about that? In Michigan, there is. We, we have performance measures and we do measure productivity and we um, make that data public. That is something we actually can measure ourselves and make public. They, the judges um, were quite resistant when we started it, um, but have come around because it turns out um, they almost always can tell a compelling story to their funding units um, about, about you know, what they're up to. They worried when we um, rolled it out uh, at the beginning that oppon their opponents might use it against them somehow in elections. So that was actually um, the, the, the concern they voiced, but they've come around and are completely on board with it. I think a, a number of states probably do that. Um, I see some nodding from other judges, but um, I don't know if, if they all do, but we do. Um, well, at the afternoon session is about uh, 
changes in procedural rules and how effect change we've already spoken about some. <laughs> but I wonder if you could go a little deeper. I mean, you you seem to be to be someone who's been incredibly effective using the whole pulpit and being persistent and being creative. Uh, I know our shop links the states, and you know we we think of that or we see that on the ground as incentivizing people. Um, and maybe just the big idea of access to justice is inspirational. But I just wonder if you could put give us your take on like what is what really is involved in getting people motivated, uh, judges and others around making the changes that you want to see in the civil justice. Um, I thought it was. I thought at the beginning of your question was literally about process implication within like different case types, which is a huge priority of ours. You know, simplifying forms and literally simplifying um, processes, so people who are never going to be able to have a lawyer can navigate them. But you're asking, I think, more a bigger question, which is like, how do you get the whole force of the judiciary behind effect and change like that? Yeah. So that's um, harder. I, I I have I. I um, I, I think that's harder, um, but um, you, you have to, uh, in my view, again, um, find uh, the right leaders in the right places um, and collaborate with, with them. Um, so it's definitely, I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't know how much good my own advocacy or bully pulpit has done. Um, we, we, I, I, I co-chair the governor's task force on jail and pretrial incarceration. It's not in this, not in, not in this talk because this is a civil justice talk, but, but, um, we were staffed by Pew in that effort and it was a bipartisan multi-stakeholder, um, task force that, um, only thanks to Pew was able to get data to understand what was driving our jail, um, policies. I mean, our jail, incre jail bed increases, which every state has, um, but the Michigan is a weird state. The, the legislature is controlled by Republicans. The governor is Democrat. Um, and the Speaker of the House was um, my biggest ally and partner in that. And the, um, that, you know, we, we, we sent 20 unanimous bills to the governor's desk. And Michigan is now a national leader in pretrial justice reform. Um, I think 300,000 people got their driver's licenses back like overnight, you know, um, just by debt forgiveness. Um, I, you know, I think it was, there was no way I could have done it without the partners I had in the legislature. And um, we spent a lot of time in focus groups and with individual meetings with all the different stakeholders. These like sticky multi-stakeholder problems require um, really patient multi-stakeholder solutions, right? You need um, all of the stakeholders at the table and then you have to spend a lot of time with every one of them to figure out how to get everybody across the finish line. I don't know if that's a great answer. Um, in the civil justice area, I've found it a little easier um, in, I, it, in, in large part because almost everybody has somebody in their family who needs help with um, a, a family law case or a debt collection case, or a, it's just such a common experience for so many people and, and, and um, legislators, like I said, on both sides of the aisle, get these calls all the time um, from their constituents who um, missed a court date because they finally have a new job and now what do they do? And the legislators, they, they have nothing to offer these people. So the ability to actually offer them some resources that we're now um, making good on with their funding um, turns out to be a real win for them as well. So I, I, I actually find some of this, I, I think there's a real upside potential in getting different stakeholders involved in civil justice reform. Somebody back there. Do you have any automation in the civil justice space? Like for example, there's a Dutch software that you can use for divorce proceedings that you plug in all your data and it can tell you like uses AI to look at what previous decisions have been made in that space to help tell you like how your finances should be allocated between the two parties. Uh, we do not, and I don't know if other, any other states do, but I think um, it would be great. So, I mean, I think once we have statewide case management and therefore um, consistent statewide data, that's the kind of thing that we'll be able to do that will be such um, a process improvement to so many people, right? But right now it would be very hard to build. So our workaround for all the different case management systems has been for the last 15 years that we have all of our courts dump their data into this one place that we call the judicial data warehouse. And then we can, tr in, when, when, when we really want to or need to, can try and 
uh, make it talk to one another, but it's expensive and time consuming and um, it, obviously not at all user friendly. Um, so we're not there, but I hope we will be once we have statewide case management. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> so I was really interested to hear you discuss Zoom proceedings and a sort of explosion of that. Um, and it definitely aligned with my experience as a litigator, just seeing how much easier it was for low-income people to appear in court when they didn't have to take the day off of work or get childcare, all the things you discussed. Um, there's a professor at Indiana University who's done really interesting research on Zoom proceedings there. And what he found was that just in studying all these Zoom proceedings, that many low-income litigants didn't have the Zoom app. And so therefore were calling in on their phone. That's how they were accessing. And the result is that they have a little black box. They don't actually appear on camera. Yep. Um, and so you get this situation where there's oftentimes a lawyer on the other side who's appearing in a full suit, visible to the judge. The judge is on camera and the low-income litigant is literally a black box. Um, and so he sort of is arguing that that's something we should be concerned about. Um, just in the sense of judges not seeing the people they're evicting or you know, taking removing children from or whatever. So I was wondering if that's something you have seen as well and if that is a concern that I'm um, sort of addressing in this expansion of Zoom proceedings. Yes, I know his data um, and I've seen it and I've read it um, and it is not consistent with ours in Michigan. It's not consistent with Texas. Um, I worry a little bit that the, I, I, the Chief Justice of Indiana is one of my closest friends, I adore her, but I worry a little bit that they might not be spending enough time on the front end with their litigants. I mean, the Zoom courtrooms, one reason why judges and court staff don't like it is they it, it takes longer to get it set up properly, right? So you have to actually put in the work at the front end to make sure a litigant um, downloads the app and is therefore on equal footing if there's a lawyer on the other side. Um, and that sort of, you know, it, it really changes the nature of work for court staff. I mean, um, you need technology bailiffs instead of physical bailiffs, literally. You need, you know, people who can actually help um, at, educate the litigants about, about, about what their courtrooms look like. Um, but I don't understand exactly why Indiana has that, that number of litigants appearing that way. And I, I worry a little bit that it's a, a, a little bit of a miss at the front end um, because it doesn't, comport with what we've seen in Texas or Michigan. I'd love to hear more about the ODR program that you said was implemented statewide. Um, we, um, I think some people proposed that in New York for consumer debt cases, and we were just very concerned about there being insufficient guardrails, especially since it was already such an unlevel playing field for pro se defendants, if they were required to participate in ODR. So can you talk about any of those kinds of issues that you had to grapple with and what solutions you might've come up with? Yeah, so we have not allowed consumer debt cases onto our ODR platform yet. Um, and we won't unless the, we have a, a debt collection work group within our Justice for All Commission, and they're going to be they're going to take the lead on you know what process improvements make sense there. One of their recommendations in this new data that's coming out is to move some of the some of the cases to alternative dispute resolution platforms, maybe maybe our MyResolve platform, um, but I'm sure it'll have you know guardrails to 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 address some of the things you're worried about. Um, the kinds of cases that are there now are. Um, both sides unrepresented. So, so um, and small dollar um, disputes, things that might have been on a small claims docket, um, um, and 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 so we haven't had those concerns yet. Um, but we want to figure it out because um, if it turns out to be a good solution for some of those cases, if we can build in the guardrails and the help, um, it's probably worth figuring out, according to our JFA debt collection group. Um, talking to attorneys in Massachusetts who do lawyer for a day type representation, they have felt a little bit torn by the remote hearings because while it might be easier for the client to participate, they find that they have lower rates of clients agreeing to talk to them even about whether they could provide assistance. And I'm wondering if, um, if you've tried to work with lawyer for the day style programs within those remote hearings and if you've come up with any uh, strategies for dealing with that. 
That's a good question. And probably there are people in my state that have better information about it than I do, but we, we have um, had a, a, a lot more of those um, lawyers offering sometimes in Michigan, it's half a day or, you know, three hours in the morning on the, on this particular court's docket. Um, and a lot more interest because of the remote option from lawyers. Um, and a lot of the way we staffed our eviction diversion program, which required uh, that any tenant who wanted it to be to have uh, a lawyer or at least be able to talk to a lawyer and that the judge had to tell the tenant that. Um, and so we had to hire up a lot of temporary extra lawyers to handle those cases around the state. Um, but I haven't heard that feedback. Um, our legal aid offices overwhelmingly supported keeping remote proceedings um, in many of the thing, many of the parts of the cases that they did. So I don't, there's probably somebody who knows more about it than I do. I got this music for the end of my <laughs> presentation. I hope you enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. You are welcome. Thank you all.